But the results were quite shocking in a way. It just showed that there's no nation that was meeting the needs of its residents within fair shares of planetary boundaries. How can you say to these nations that given the histories of colonialism and the histories that we've been experiencing over the past century, that now they need to radically reduce their levels of resource use? You know, it's just not fair when you take into account those historical responsibilities. Because over-emitting nations have already taken They've appropriated their fair share. It was another one of those moments where I was just seeing something in a different way than you had seen it before. It just just hit me, the injustice of it. For example, for the 1.5 degree carbon budget, we find that already all Global North nations have substantially overshot fair shares of the 1.5 degree bound by two to four times. Hello everyone and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our societies or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just and context specific way. And today we'll talk about how to provide safe and just space for all. Can we provide essential services of food, housing, mobility, education, and many more to everyone, everywhere, and still stay within planetary boundaries. To help us navigate through these difficult questions, I have the pleasure to welcome Andrew Fanning. Andrew is an ecological economist that tracked nation's progress of both meeting the essential needs and respecting the environmental limits. He's currently an analysis and research lead at the Donut Economics Action Lab, and he's also a visiting research fellow at the Sustainability Research Institute at the University of Leeds. With all that being said, Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Can you let us know what made you become an ecological economist into this topic of living well within limits or, you know, the quantitative analysis, uh, having these two Uh, boundaries, the environmental one and the social one. When did I first learn about ecological economics was in 2010, so now about 13 years ago. And I was, uh, I did an undergrad in economics, so I'm trained in, in mainstream economics in a very traditional department of economics. Uh, well, at the same time, I was also doing a major, you know, a double major in international development studies, which is just the hmm. polar opposite of of traditional economics where you're learning all about all these, you know, critical social science fields like dependency theory, world systems theory, like uh, very, very critical of the of the economic system that we have inherited. So I was just getting ripped apart by these two different uh, different themes. But I went to economics almost as a know thy enemy type of thing. This is the main language of public policy of like I want to understand and ideally help make the world a better place. But what I found was that these these disciplines were, in a sense, almost very normative. Like, the, yeah, of course, I was much more on the side of the international development studies scholars, where you know, advocating for much more progressive and justice oriented restructuring of the world economy and all of that stuff. You know, getting rid of poverty, but recognizing that capitalism and the entrenched structure that we have inherited is is driving that. But there wasn't really much of a of a of a grounding in the physical world, so I was sort of mm. left afloat a bit. And I, I went to do a master's in development economics again, much more on the traditional side. But as an elective, I found a course. I wanted to take a course in environmental economics. Uh -huh. uh, this before I knew anything about ecological <laughs> economics, and just to, as an illustration of how kind of traditional my department of economics was. They weren't even offering at the graduate level a course in environmental economics. And so I started looking around and I found a course in, in the School for Management called Resource for, uh, what was it? Economics for Resources and Environmental Management. And I was uh -huh. like, oh, that sounds like, that sounds like what I'm looking for. Has the environment inside? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, right. yeah. so I, yeah. So I contacted the professor because it wasn't in my department, and I was like, "Hey, can I join this class?" And and he was kind of like, "Well, you're in a like train six years deep into formal economics now. I don't know if you're going to get much from this class. It's mainly kind of for natural scientists who are 
getting introduced to public policy and management. And I was like, okay, well, let me check it out. It actually turned out to be a course in ecological economics, like just through and through. And the first course, you know, the readings were loaded with Herman Daly and Bill Reese and just all of this post-growth world that recognizes that, you know, the economy is embedded in society, which is embedded in, in the natural living world, which we are fundamentally dependent on. And because of that, we need to question this idea of infinite economic growth if we're on a finite planet. And everyone in the room, I remember, there was about 30 students and they were just like, yeah, of course we need to, we need to question <laughs> mining economics. You know, nothing grows forever on, in a finite space. And I was just like, like my, because I could see, again, that six years of formal economics training and I just felt like as if I had been blinded uh -huh. and that I was now starting to see. So it was a very, for anyone who's read Herman Daly, it's I think a very familiar post Herman Daly reading. And for me, that was just my discovery of the field. Must be qu quite uh, both exciting and painful at the same time to say like, what did I do for six years or how come this is still possible, no? Yeah, exactly. It's, you just feel, well, I've certainly felt as if, as I said, like, as if I, as if I had been blinded, I, I, maybe I'm, I should have taken more impetus on myself. But of course, you know, when you're a student, you, you almost pick up what you're handed, right? And I had never been handed these materials. So I was almost, I was angry that this literature went back since the 1970s. This man had been writing these ideas and these concepts well known and established and so it just led me on a discovery of kind of angry exploration uh, which <laughs> made me of course very critical once i had seen it it's just something that you can't unsee in my in my case so i think of it like like in the matrix where you is it the red pill or the blue pill and once you take which pill is it that he takes the red one i, nope. I think it's red oh. yeah yeah <laughs> whichever one that you take uh <laughs> then it's just there's no going back and that's yeah. what i've been doing i've been reading i've been asking questions and was privileged enough to start a PhD program. Uh, my daughter was born, so I moved to Spain where my partner is Spanish. And so I was doing my PhD here, got in touch with that same professor from ecological economics at my university. Turned out that uh, an ecological economist named Dan O'Neill was also one of his students. Uh, just by coincidence, about five or six years earlier, they, <laughs> he had taken the same course in the same university. And he was at the University of Leeds. So I reached out to him uh, to see if he'd be interested in, in co-supervising my, my thesis. So anyway, definitely took the red pill. And yeah. from then on, it's, it's just been quite the journey. Uh, I had a, an episode. Um, I had two episodes with Timothée Parik, one in French, one in English. And in the French one, one of his uh, catchphrases where we need to red pill the the system. So I think it's red pill, the, the right <laughs> one. <laughs> or we can trust, trust him to, yeah, to be on the pulse of the social. I would say so. I would say so. Yeah. So you went and quantified a number of elements. So both biophysical characteristics and social characteristics of nations for your PhD and then onwards. Um, of course, this is very, very close to the concept of donut economics, right? Uh, there are two boundaries, um, one upper, one lower, and you try to downscale this at a national level. I'm pretty sure that everybody listening or watching knows about plan uh, you know, planetary boundaries, donut economics, but just in case some people do not, I think it's important that right now we do this introduction and you know we, we have a, a similar foundation for everyone. Can you tell us a bit what are donut economics and what you did after that? We're going to go into the downscaling of that. Yeah, sure. That's, I mean, I'm currently, as you mentioned, research and data analysis lead at Donut Economics Action Lab. So I work closely with with a number of colleagues, including Kate Rayworth, who created the concept uh, and launched a discussion paper in the run-up to the Sustainable Development Goals in 2012, uh, called you know where she drew the donut, which is essentially these two concentric rings. On the outside is an ecological ceiling, which is informed by the planetary boundaries framework. So that was proposed in 2009 by Johan Rockström and, and a whole bunch of leading Earth system scientists, and Kate saw this concept of, you know, it was almost just is such a visual and easy to understand way to communicate 
both the complexity of the Earth system, like it's not just one thing. We need to worry about climate change, there's biodiversity loss, there's excessive nutrients, there's land system change, there's, of course, what happens with the ozone layer. And, you know, they identify these nine Earth system processes and said, you know, we would do well to stay within these boundaries that are, you know, we can relate to the reference state of the Holocene. The Holocene, the past 11,000 years during which all of human civilization has arisen. So let's let's stick with that uh, that state <laughs> of the It works so well so far, yeah. Yeah, it's doing, we're doing okay. Uh, at least the rise of civilization and all of that seems like something we should safeguard. And at the same time, that doesn't tell us much about what it means to to meet the needs of all our people. And so what Kate did was essentially draw a social foundation inside the ecological ceiling, making a donut-shaped space. And the social foundation is, you know, with the, the things that people's need, their life's essentials around food and health and education and sanitation and water, and not just, you know, physical subsistence, but also social equity and gender equality and political voice and so on and so on. And she made the argument that, of course, we need to keep resource use within the, you know, an acceptable level below the ecological ceiling, but people also have fundamental needs, which they need resources in order to achieve. So we need to be above the social foundation and that safe and just space, which is made up by the donut is, is essentially what that's meant to show. And, and as a visual, it's, it's really, really powerful because, again, you take all these different things that we tend to have this reductionist mind, like, I work in food, I work in climate, I work in education, da, 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 da. but that's fine because, you know, we, people need, if you just take on everything all the time, it's just too much. So, but what the donut is really helpful for, I think, is to, to provide that holistic tapestry almost, or it shows the goal that we want to be meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And of course, there's different things that we need to focus on, but let's not lose sight of the whole picture. So that to me is the donut. Yeah. As you say, this is very easily understood. It's a bit like a compass for where we should be heading. Um, But of course, at a global level, a bit like the planetary boundaries, they enable us to kind of get a pulse of the situation but they remain a bit too macro, right? They they don't enable us to see, okay, so what do we do now? We know we need to reduce or increase, right? But where, how, and all of that. And that's where you come in as well, and you increase the sample size by downscaling it, right? There we start, you know, getting something out of it. We start to compare, we start to understand, okay, perhaps there are different ways to get to the same results. What is the right way? Asking, you know, different questions. I think one is the vision. And now you start implementing that vision or understanding why and stuff like that. So what happened there? You you just try to, what what is the impetus behind it? Perhaps I'm putting words in your mouth, but what was the, the idea when you wanted to, to downscale the, 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 the donut? Pretty much the, the motivation was that when you look at this global picture, you, you you very quickly, if you're starting to think about, okay, what do I do now? You're just missing some very important context. So you're not able to say, most critically, I mean, just at a very high level, like we already know that some society, some parts of the world are much more responsible for overshooting planetary boundaries. Like the, that ecological crisis that we're facing has been driven overwhelmingly by the by the wealthiest parts of the world and within wealthy nations, even you know by the wealthiest within those as well. So that's one piece that we know is that's not captured when in this global picture of like humanity, as if humanity yeah. is a single entity. When we know that that's not the case, but at the same time, it's socially there are different capacities in terms of reaching the social foundation, and those. Both of those responsibilities and capacities are deeply intertwined through history, through colonialism, through through you know legacies of slavery, and and that world system that we live within is you know vastly and deeply unequal. So how do we start to 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 tease that apart so that we're not saying you know humanity as a whole is 
overshooting multiple planetary boundaries, yet while at the same time billions of people are falling short. That's true, but there's different scales of who's overshooting and who's falling short. So we wanted to to start unpacking that a bit. And one way to do so, where data is available at least, to start painting a rough contour. Like I wouldn't say these these results are are like a mirror image of any given country, but what we tried to do was to get as many countries as we could together and assemble globally comparable data where we could look at, you know, what level of, what is a fair share of planetary boundaries and what level of resource use are you, have you been using? And at the same time, you know, uh, if we define a minimum social threshold, like a minimum decent standard quality of life, at least on an international basis, then how are different nations doing across it? That was essentially our, our, the project that we set out for ourselves. We ended up starting in 2015 and just kind of being like, well, this will be easy. <laughs> of course. We published, we published the study in 2018. So it took us a, it took us a little while to, to come out with something. And, and it was surprisingly more difficult than I would have thought. But the results were 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 quite shocking in a way uh, because it just showed that you know there's no nation that was meeting the needs of its residents within fair shares of planetary boundaries, but that there were different pathways almost uh, the reasons that for the reasons that that was taking place. This is yeah. I mean, when reading this study and having this, uh, so a good life uh, for all within planetary boundaries. Um, it's quite shocking when you arrive at this conclusion. No countries meet the basic needs of its citizens at a globally sustainable level. This is really gut wrenching. I mean, it 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 is like a visceral reaction based on that. But of course, as you say, this is a tapestry of some either transgress too many physical boundaries while uh, achieving a number of social thresholds, whereas others do not manage to. Uh, to well to s fulfill these social thresholds but do not transgress by a physical boundary so the story there is, is is very rich how do you say what is just for each country how do you downscale the planetary boundary is, is it just a per capita is there something more and we're gonna go afterwards with responsibility and cumulative emissions but at this stage for this study was it just scaled down by population yeah, for the most part, well, in that first study, it was literally annual per capita equivalent. So we, we took for those planetary boundaries where you could downscale them to equivalent units or we did a conversion. So say for climate change, the planetary boundary is expressed as 350 parts per million CO2, which of course is a concentration, but nations you know, emit carbon over a period of time. So we converted the the concentration of parts per million into equivalent carbon dioxide, annual carbon dioxide emissions per year, and work that out into a budget of what would be needed to respect a 1.5 degree uh, future. And we said, okay, based on this carbon budget, then what is the level of annual emissions that we that could be allocated to to a country or to the world as a whole? And that gives you your annual per capita boundary which worked out to be around 1.6 tons of CO2 per person. Mm. And then you can then say, okay, well, that's the boundary. Then what is the, what is the level of CO2 emissions per person accounting for international trade? So using footprint-based measures that can, that can account for you know, the consumption that's associated, the, the emissions associated with a country's final consumption. Like, their goods and services and and we did that for those indicators that were that we could do that for so it was annual per capita for climate change for phosphorus nitrogen freshwater use uh, material use and ecological footprint as well and there i think what's also very important is that all of these studies tell you a status quo but also tell you that this is not a fatality, right? I mean, it's not because it is like that that it should be like that and that it will be like that. So I think it's important to to underline here how, well, if everybody were to do this, like the wealthy countries uh, 
we would we already exceed a number of these boundaries, but we would exceed far more than what we're doing today. But there is also the possibility to stay within well um, satisfying basic needs or what, what are some of the, the insights there? I mean, definitely, for sure. When you look at any empirical data, it's showing you uh, it, like a biased view because we already we know that we live in a deeply unequal and unjust uh, world. And so we're working to transform that then there's, it's almost a double-edged sword of using empirical data to draw conclusions because we already know the world that we have is, is in need of transformation. But the, I would say the biggest thing that we've pointed to in that article and in other work, especially led by Julia Steinberger around provisioning systems and all that is we're really looking, it's very blunt what the data can tell us, that we're looking at social outcomes at a national level and, you know, aggregate levels of resource use. And we're finding relationships between those two things. And when you look at a bunch of countries, you see some variability across those. Like, it, I mean, the United States and Canada, where I was born, and Australia tend to show up as this very extreme levels of resource use with similar levels of social performance as you see in lots of continental Europe and whatever. So mm. clearly, to achieve these social outcomes, the levels of resource use that are observed in Canada and the United States are not going towards the satisfaction of, of these social outcomes because they're just they're unrelated beyond a certain level. There's a saturation curve after, yeah, after exactly. which you cannot, yeah. So you tend to see a very low levels of resource use of like the classic diminishing returns, right? Like, of course, nations need some level of resource use to go from zero into building up that critical provisioning infrastructure for roads and hospitals and like water and sanitation, all that stuff. But eventually, you know, our, where places in the global north, we've hit that point long ago uh, where what we need to do is essentially maintain the infrastructure that we have already built up over the past century or more. And additional resource use in aggregate terms is not really providing much in terms of social outcomes. And so... These, these relationships, they don't really tell us anything about, about the systems that are provisioning that are, actually, that are actually generating the outcomes. And that's what this, with, you know, Julia in particular, her research project around living well within limits and their, their research project together with Yorgo Scalis and Jason Hickel are also starting to unpack. It says, okay, how, how can we understand this variability and start finding those levers and those points where we can, where we can achieve high levels of social outcomes without, you know, with as low as possible levels of resource use. We can expand a bit on your analysis. So you did two other studies, let's say after that, that went and gave a more spatial or let's say temporal dynamic, but also international um, dynamic, so between countries. So there was the other study I wanted to discuss, which was uh, the social shortfall and ecological overshoot of nations, where there you, you took more or less the same data set and you expanded over time. Uh, so it was, what, 20, 23 years or so uh, of, um, of dynamics. And I think it's important to, when you don't manage to make a causal relationship to such a complicated element, right? I mean, have social outcomes and uh, physical boundaries and make a, a causal relationship is extremely difficult or impossible to do. So you try to enrich it, right? You try to understand to understand the dynamics over time between countries and stuff like that. So if we do it over time, you also found that countries tend to go to transgress, if I remember correctly, faster the planetary boundaries than achieving their social foundation. So something like that, right? Yeah, that was what we found. I mean, building on the, it was very, quite intentional, trying to build on the first study as much as we could with saying, okay, let's try and find as, as similar to the indicators as possible or the exact same ones, except explore, explore what it could look like over time. Because the number one question we received when presenting that first study, which is for a single year, was, you know, just like, okay, but is anyone heading towards it? Like, what's the directionality here? Are we all moving away? And, and I, you know, that was the immediate next 
next thing to explore. And so we picked it up and, and effectively we found that trajectory that you just described. It was almost that we tended to see nations, well, two groups, three different groups of countries. Two of them didn't really move much at all over the period from 1992 to 2015, which is our analysis period. Two of them just essentially stayed in, in the same spots. And that is effectively what we would call very low income, low resource use, and low social performance. So think Kenya, Malawi, and Nigeria, and, and other low income nations that didn't really move much. Other high income nations, if you think of when I say move much, I'm talking about like the extent to which they transgress boundaries. So like the number of boundaries that are transgressed or that the social thresholds that are achieved. And if you look at that, at if you say, hey, let's look at these six biophysical boundaries, how many have you transgressed? Yes or no? Like, and we find one group of high income, high resource using nations that didn't really change because they were already transgressing all the boundaries and achieving as many social indicators over the period as well. And then you have this third group of middle income and low income emerging economies that did show some change, but they tended to be overshooting planetary boundaries faster than they were achieving social improvement. So we kind of saw them moving along. If you think of, I always think of things in charts. So if you think of it like a, a chart, then it's almost like moving along the bottom of that chart, transgressing more and more boundaries before starting to, to achieve more social outcomes. And and that was, you know, also not exactly the picture that we wanted to see. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but again, that variability does come out. And one country that consistently comes out in this study and in many others is, is Costa Rica that consistently, you know, comes out of the data as a nation that, that is transforming resources into the satisfaction of human needs more effectively than any other nation. Like they're really kind of the closest to living within the donut of any country that we've found. And so we, you know, I take some hope from that because of course every country has its own context and its own challenges, but there's arguably much more that the international community could do to support Costa Rica. And also as a nation that Costa Rica itself could organize to, in order to be even more effectively if we actually put our minds to, to trying this. Yeah, it's it's interesting indeed this uh, this dynamic. Of course, I mean it's very hard to to accept yet another gut wrenching result to to see that we need this launching phase bef before we yield uh, yield the results. Um, of course, once again, this is currently how it's made. It doesn't tell us much about how we could do things. Um, yeah, it's. It's, it's really just the trajectory of, you know, modernization theory, you know, industrialization based on economic growth is like, you know, you know, all of these critiques of the economic system are almost present in that picture because there's, there's the idea that we can, you know, you need growth and if you sacrifice your environment and your production and all of this and dirty up your nation, then once you're rich enough, you can clean it up again, kind of, kind of idea. And to an extent, of course, some very low income nations, as I said, do need to build up that productive capacity, but but not just production for its own sake. It should be for production towards meeting essential needs. And that's not what the world system that was geared up to do with export substitution and you know, the the other the other many challenges around globalization and, and all of that. But I think that it's uh, it's evident in the data that this is the trajectory that has effectively been been given as a recipe to many of these countries of the world. And and so we shouldn't expect if we're aiming to transform that that recipe would would serve our pur purposes today. Yeah, and I can imagine it must feel a bit uh, uncomfortable that other people use your findings to justify green growth and stuff like that because it's demonstrated that's how we have always done. We just need to wait for a couple of decades and everything will be fine. So I think it must be quite hard to, to produce results and kind of know what they mean because you have the subtlety and the, you know, the nuance of what it really means. And also given, you know, I mean, uh, 
if we didn't had the urgency, the climate and um, the social urgency, we could say, okay, let, let's wait out a couple of decades and perhaps, you know, smoothly things would go our way. But of course, that's the, the crux, right? The, the time. Yeah, yeah. So again, I tend to think in terms of, the, of those charts that <laughs> if you think of like that diminishing returns chart, I think that, um, you know, a, a lot of high income nations, just talking about high income nations now, speaking about green growth and, and degrowth and post growth, one thing that I think is worth acknowledging and, and celebrating a little bit, uh, the point that we are at today, is that I think that there's broad agreement that if you look at that chart and the levels of aggregate <laughs> overshoot, um, everyone has agreed that what we need to do in these high income nations is we need to dramatically reduce levels of resource use so that they're within fair shares of planetary boundaries. And of course, the crux is how do you do that? And is is continued economic growth in aggregate terms the way to do so? So I think that, but at least recognizing that green growth, degrowth, and post growth, we're all more or less aligned on that on that goal. But then it's of course how do we get there? And you could look at you know what is the likelihood that, of being able to massively reduce resource use to levels that are consistent with planetary boundaries while continuously growing the size of your economy forever? Or do you take the view of a more steady state? Or should it be a more degrowth type of planned planned reduction? Or do you know, do you just think, well, we're let's make this last as long as we can, and it's gonna collapse anyway. And so so there's different trajectories that that are possible in order to achieve that. So I think that it's worth it's worth recognizing, I think around the the narratives around green growth that at least we're agreed on that point, even if I'm very skeptical around the the ability to continue growing or the desirability to continue growing the economy in these high income nations. Well, yeah, it's it's a it's a fair question to un to to unpack whether, you know, people that do believe in green growth do have the same end objective in mind if they do believe that economy should grow. So, you know, there is a fundamental um, question there that is beyond just economics. It, it is a fundamental understanding and worldview, right? And I think over there is also one of the challenges, but uh, let's uh, let's keep that for, for another moment. Um, <laughs> you mentioned as well right now about different scenarios right i mean uh, how this could go in the future if we take on the green growth or the 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 degrowth or the post growth approach and all of that and in this paper you also had uh, business as usual projections to 2050 and they tell us uh well they give us very good insights about the the sheer um scale both in speed and you know in magnitude of the transformation that needs to be carried out right yeah yeah and i think this these definitely need to come with the caveat that has already been mentioned right is that uh, that when you look when you project forwards based on historical trends then you're only going to see you know a, a tiny window of of what is possible right because you're looking at what what is not what could be and and of course, when you when you do that, what we find was that essentially things things get worse ecologically, and and there's insufficient advances in social performance. So, I would say that the the social projections were a bit more surprising to me, like that, mm. because I had almost I I continually approach this work because maybe I'm too much of a hopeless you know eternal optimist, but I'm like. Maybe there'll be some like some of these indicators where if we look ahead to 2015, based on the past 25 years of advances, that if we continue along on this rate, then most of the world or a large proportion of the world would actually achieve achieve the the minimum thresholds that we've defined. And for some, that's true. When in the rolling out of access to electricity, of course, that doesn't say anything about reliability of that electricity, but it's it's it, there's a couple indicators that were like showing you know as almost all nations in the world if we continue along 
assuming that ecological breakdown and climate crisis and all of that don't have any impact on, like we just looked at each of these indicators by themselves, right? We didn't look at any interactions across. So, so on the one hand, I see these projections both socially and ecologically as you could see it either way, really. It's like could be seen as optimistic because we're not taking into account the fact that the climate and, and these changes that climate science is, is showing if we continue along this path in terms of losses and damages and storms, and droughts and floods. And so we're not taking those into account. So how could you expect that energy provisioning would remain the same? Uh, but at the same time, it could also be seen as pessimistic because it's it's assuming that the types of policies that green growth and post growth and deep growth advocates are are pushing for and that we know are needed, we're assuming that those don't occur. And so that's also the you know, it just gives a tiny, tiny again. As I picture it like the a window yeah. of what's possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm also wondering, of course, in terms of. Um... Research. I'm also a, an optimist, but uh, imagine if we could have this study carried out for a hundred, two hundred, three hundred years in the past, because of course, you know, we still lived back in the 19th century, right? We we still had some elements and still had some social thresholds that were achieved back in the day, right? So what happened, when did it happen, how this was also combined with political and technological innovations or or configurations or constellations. You know, that would be, of course, the, the, the great revelation because in 20 years, you, you can't really understand the relationship of how one grows with the other. Yeah, no, you're totally right. And that just brings me back to doing this analysis, which is like, <laughs> memory that I've apparently repressed so many hours of trying to look at look at data and and but it really reminds me of, like I I wanted to get the analysis back to as far as possible and we could do so for a decent number of countries back to 1970 1970 uh, especially for the ecological indicators but just the social indicators it was just not possible to do so with a reasonable level of of country coverage so some nations could go back but but then you start what you end up doing is these deep dives into individual country case studies where there's fascinating insights uh where you can look at the united states or germany or china or india and find data that can paint a very rich picture for that nation but you start losing sight of the of the global picture which is what what we wanted to bring with this study and so, but I had made some heroic assumptions on based on the 1990s era for particularly Western Europe countries, where I was like, okay, well, let's just assume this isn't published or anything. This is for my own exploratory stuff. But if we assume that these nations, you know, things haven't gotten particularly worse between 1990s and 1970, so what if we just carry that backwards and look at performance? Um, how are they doing then? Like then, does anybody <laughs> like the constant? Does anybody make it then? Yeah. Um, then, <laughs> when can we be saved? Please you know, let me know. <laughs> but um, and we actually in that in that experiment, like thought experiment, with the assumptions that that were made that were published, I did find that actually the Netherlands stood out as one of the only nations that actually achieved a decent. You know, we started to get into this. We we divided up a chart into into different sections, and they actually entered into the section where they were only sh overshooting two of the six boundaries. Of course, those were the boundaries for climate change and material use. So it was it's still problematic, but they they got closer to achieving the vision of the donut. But of course, moving over time away from that vision. So. I came across a, who is it, Vaclav Smil, who makes an argument that, you know, if we go back to energy use of, of Western Europe in the 1960s, would have been a more or less sustainable level of resource use to be extended to all people. And so those findings are arguably in, in line with what, he was, with what he was suggesting. Then, of course, the question is, how do we restructure our economy so that we're not, so that 
you know, people can meet their essential needs at that level of resource use without falling into you know, critical deprivation in that. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Julia and colleagues also did something about uh, the low energy demand scenario. A bit, yeah. Something like that. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think the conclusion was very similar, like uh, energy levels uh, back. I, I think it was for 2050, if everybody had met uh, all of their needs with a low energy demand scenario, uh, it would come back to the consumption of the 1960s or something like that. So we had like almost a century away uh, difference in terms of energy use. And I was like, okay, this is very... Opt uh, not optimistic, that's not the word I want, um, um, something to look forward to, right? I mean, th this is something that you're like, okay, th this makes sense and I want to, to, to work for that and I want to, you know, put all of my efforts in, in this word, in, in this word view, right? So I think th that's something interesting to, to, to use these analysis as well for thought experiments and kind of understand as well that this is completely feasible with these conditions and with these societal, political, technological, and many other caveats. But, you know, we can use them as perhaps prospective tools as well instead of just uh, retrospective, right? Yeah. yeah, I would completely agree. And and I think tied to that is very much this, this notion of, of, like, sufficiency. Like, what is what is the levels that are, that are needed? And, I remember Joel Millward Hopkins has a study in 2020, decent, decent living standards for energy. And he has a line in the paper that's, that, I mean, with co-authors as well, but it's like, yeah, people worry about going back to that. We're talking about going back to living caves and yeah. I mean, maybe that's true, but like these caves are, you know, they have hospitals, they have running water, they have lights, they have like decent living standards for everyone they're well connected to other caves where other and it's like well you know what like it's not such a bad thing like yeah that must be the study i, I was referring to as well um, yeah so you said that for some countries you managed to go to the 70s and i guess this is also the paper that you did uh i think it's with jason uh on the national responsibility for ecological breakdown uh, and over there, you, you also go a step further, including the justice element, right? So what is a fair share for everyone to get? It, it's kind of a who gets from whom or who develops who, you know? I mean, these questions are very prominent when you look at all the countries and stuff like that. What, what are some uh, insights over there? I think high income nations were responsible for three quarters of global excess material use or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And this this work really, it kind of, for me, it brought me back to what I was talking about earlier in my bachelor's where I was doing international development studies. And when I first started into ecological economics, I, I kind of somewhat put that, put that kind of very critical social science, uh, world systems view, uh, dependency theory, you know, recognizing that there's a core and there's a periphery and one is underdeveloping the other. Um, I kind of put that work to the side as we did this more accounting-based kind of diagnosis of working with the donut. And and it's been really nice to get in touch, particularly with Jason Hickel, to start collaborating with him because he's he's brought that brought that work back for me personally, back to something that I care deeply about, but also brought to the field of ecological economics, I'd argue, more much more focus on these kind of big global injustices and the histories and legacies of colonialism and all of that. And so he really, he had a previous paper, I think it was single authored, which was Quantifying Responsibility for Climate Breakdown that he published. And the core difference, I mean, both of these studies or approaches are really talking about a fair share of, say, if it's for carbon of a, a carbon budget or a planetary boundary or whatever. But the difference is that Instead of looking at it as a ratio, which is what we did to almost create those wedges in a donut chart, where you say, okay, here's the level of resource divided by what your boundary is. If it's over one, then that means that you're an overshoot. Uh, Jason's approach was to say, okay, what's a fair share? But let's look at this cumulatively. And what's the cumulative fair share? And instead of that division or a ratio, it's saying, how much are you in excess or not? So you subtract. So you 
basically if you're in you take whatever the level of resource use minus your fair share you end up with the you know a, a measure of excess resource use and the thing about that that difference is instead of it being a unitless like ratio then it's still in the units that you're working with and you can actually add up all of the 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 excess emissions across all countries and you end up with a total excess emissions and then you can start saying okay well who's responsible because you actually have the the units to say well the united states is responsible for 40 percent of the total excess emissions that we observe or 74 percent is the us and the uk and the eu and and so on so i think that it's a it's a very very powerful approach for as framed to start allocating responsibilities for ecological and climate breakdown that that we're living through. Yeah, of course. And with um, in the latest latest COP, there was this loss and damages uh, component that they wanted to add. And I think at a certain point, there is not going to be a successful ecological transition if we do not address this, right? Or it's going to be a new form of colonialism in some way or another. Yeah, I mean, I. I saw that in particular, so we did the work with the resources, the National Responsibility for Ecological Breakdown afterwards, which was almost a companion piece to the climate breakdown one that Jason had run by himself, because of course it's not just carbon emissions. We know that resource use is driving is driving ecological crises that are, even if we clean up the climate, if we're still wedded to, well, clean up, even if we transi- transform to a low carbon economy if we're still wedded to this idea of, of economic growth and continual expansion then we're you know we're going to run into the same issues just with different different biophysical processes now it's not carbon or the climate but now it's biodiversity loss and and so on and so what did we do in the second study because i did come across jason's quantifying national responsibility for a climate breakdown I thought that that was a, a better approach than what we did in the first National Donuts one. So in that national, in the first national analysis, we converted it to an annual per capita value, as I mentioned, like 1.6 tons per person per year. But the problem with that is, of course, like that sounds very ambitious for those of us who are sitting in the global north who have any understanding of the level of emissions that we currently have, especially like Canada or the United States. So, going from 16 tons per person per year to 1.6 tons per person per year is, you know, a very, very ambitious thing to say to someone. And they, they, people go, wow, okay. But of course, what it doesn't give you anything to be able to say is to the people in Kenya or the people in Malaysia or the who, is, who say it's Malaysia where emissions, I don't know the exact numbers right now, but say it's three tons per capita. How can you say to these nations that oh, given the histories of colonialism and the histories of, that we've been experiencing over the past century, that now they need to radically reduce their levels of resource use down to 1.6 tons. So it's just, you know, it's just not fair when you take into account those historical responsibilities. So I really wanted to bring that into the National Donuts one. And the only indicator I was able to do so was for the climate change, the climate change indicator. So in the social shortfall and ecological overshoot of nations paper, we actually brought in that approach of doing cumulative historical responsibilities. But when you do that, I've replicated the analysis uh, that Jason did, and I created some different charts because I'm always looking in, in different ways to, to see the data. So he had this really typical, what are those charts called when they're, different squares um tree maps or no how are they called yeah yeah it's like a total anyway it represents the space and then each nations gets a certain size based on the proportion of that total and of course you end up with the united states getting a big square and the uk and the eu and da, da, da. um so he had that visual representation which is like okay that makes the point but i looked at it over time and And I was just struck. It was another one of those moments where I was just seeing something in a different way than you had seen it before. It just just hit me the injustice of it, and of how much 
was being appropriated by by over emitters essentially and so i was i was struck by that but we were also looking at the planetary boundary which is 350 parts per million and that boundary was crossed in 1988 so we've always been working in this in this kind of space where the boundary has already been crossed and we're now talking about who's more responsible for crossing it and that's that's an important conversation to have but it kind of falls in terms of practice, like what do you do with that? It's it's very difficult to lessen the the concentration of CO two in the atmosphere. That has to happen through carbon sinks and natural processes over millennia. Uh, so there's like what do we do type of question. You can, there's not really much that you can say besides you know wait wait another ten thousand years and maybe we'll come back below three hundred and fifty. Um, so what I started doing, though, because everyone was talking about 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, these more political climate targets, even if they're not recognized as safe planetary boundaries by Earth system scientists, they're very relevant to the political conversation and all of that. So so I decided to, to take a look at, okay, what about these fair shares of 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, given that there's still a little bit of time that we can, that we can meet those? And and the results come out actually quite quite similar with the, for example, for the 1.5 degree carbon budget, we find that already, like all global north nations have sig- substantially overshot fair shares of the 1.5 degree boundary by two to four times type of thing. So, so, so when in you practice, s- what what does that mean? So how do we translate that in, into other words? So if we could say that. There's a global carbon budget, which is the amount of carbon remaining that could be emitted into the atmosphere to respect a given climate target. So 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees or whatever. The 1.5 degree one is is very important. And so we'll use that. And if you look cumulatively, historically, from 1960 to to respecting the climate budget of 1.5 degrees, it's about 1.8 trillion tons of carbon dioxide. And you say, okay, 1.8 trillion tons of carbon dioxide can be emitted, taking into account what has already been emitted and what's left. And divide that up across countries based on population shares, which is what we did. So a fair share is once again the population share, but accounting for the population over the entire period rather than just a single year. And when you do that, you can say, okay, each nation has a fair share of this of this global carbon budget of 1.5 degrees. And we can compare that, again, subtracting a fair share by cumulative emissions. And that will give, you know, how much this nation is over or under their their fair share. And, and we found that when you do that, it's, I guess the most surprising thing for me was to find just how far beyond those fair shares of what I thought we still had kind of some space for. When you looked at the over emitting nations, like they were crossed. We started in 1960. The U.S. I think was crossed by 19 before 1970. They had crossed their fair share of, and just basically everything since then has been appropriating. Well, has been over emitting beyond has been in excess. But now, if we're talking about if we want to respect 1.5 degrees, because that's what's needed to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, then we're effectively saying to nations who, low-emitting nations who have not used up their fair shares, that they need to, you know, mitigate, get, mitigate their levels of emissions far more rapidly than would otherwise be required because, because over-emitting nations have already taken, they've appropriated their fair shares. And that's the basis of the paper. Like that, to me, it's it's a question of, okay, let's do everything we can do to get, if the world as a whole gets to net zero by 2050, we will respect the 1.5 degree carbon budget. But there are over-emitting countries and lower-emitting countries. And so we argue that, the, that those who have emitted so much more beyond their fair shares who have appropriated the shares of others should compensate for those who are giving up, who who are basically stepping up to to balance out or to compensate to the emissions of others. 
I've noted down a couple of things while you were saying this. First of all, it's it's the the current response is as if you know it's too bad, bad luck. You you were late to the party. You don't get to admit anymore. Uh, that would be the simple way to put things. The real thing, the real way to put things is over centuries we took everything you had, and now you now that we have taken everything, you cannot admit anymore to just uh, you know. Uh, meet basic uh, needs, uh, yeah. and you need to do all of the effort. Where whereas we we had a a huge party over centuries, yeah. and they and I mean they I mean anyone in this situation would just say yeah right <laughs> okay well clearly I can't trust you to to like I can't count on you for anything, and I'm going to figure things out for myself because like this international community is just an exploitative kind of racket. And, and I think that there's some truth to that. So essentially what comes out very clearly is that what China be does because of the growth pathway over the past decades, whether or not they change to net zero or not, will be very consequential to the, to the overall picture. And I mean, India as well to an extent, but they're just so far, like they've used so little of their fair share that actually it's it's nowhere near the, the level. So what we find is that China, if it continues along a business as usual pathway, will likely cross its fair share and start shooting beyond it in as an over emitting country within the next you know 10 years or so. And, and of course, that would be catastrophic for climate stability uh, because we're talking very, very large amounts of emissions. So I think that the thing to say to countries like China or emerging economies is, is that, yes, we are, we are asking you to, to effectively slow down and not follow the development pathway that every nation has done before them and which has garnered like success and wealth and accumulation. Uh, so don't do that. But in return, we are willing to compensate you for this. So it's, it's kind of, to me, I think it's, it's maybe overly hopeful uh, for everything. And of course, it's naive and it's going to be incredibly difficult politically. But I think that it's uh, potentially a way to, to reach a consensus around 1.5 degree warmer future. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into the um, compensation part of the atmospheric appropriation the, just the last note I had uh, when you did this fair share you, you also said you started in the uh, 60s or 70s if we had done the same exercise starting in the beginning of the century perhaps the US might have over you know overshot even earlier or something like that right the longer we stretch I guess the, the cumulative emissions the longer uh, that the bigger the responsibility and the overshoot or the earlier the overshoot would be for countries like England or France or something like that, I can imagine. Yeah, there's there's some interesting variability there, actually. So we looked at, we argued in the main results that 1960 is more or less a reasonable, a reasonable baseline because we also looked at 1850 as a starting year and 1992 as a starting year. And... We argue that the, the later starting year, 1992, was uh, unjust from an ethical perspective, especially if you read the preamble to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which explicitly acknowledges the importance of historical responsibilities already in 1992. So to me, it just seems wrong to, to erase, essentially forgive any, any emissions before then on that basis. But... You can also go all the way back to 1850. And the couple of interesting things were then, I mean, if you look at those ratios of overshoot to, you know, em cumulative emissions over the cumulative fair share, then actually the ratios don't change a whole lot. I was surprised by that, that it, it didn't end up being, you know, if it's four times, if the U.S. is four times over starting from 1960, you would think it would be eight times over if you went all the way back to 1850. But of course, the fair share gets much bigger over that period as well. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. it starts bringing in population dynamics in that time period as well. And so because of that, there was an interesting population almost balancing effect because 
essentially nations which are historically or and currently are high emitting have quite low levels of population growth. So the further back in time that you go, the larger share, the, the relative proportion of the population they received, if that makes sense. Um, anyway, the, the end story was that those ratios in and of themselves didn't change very much uh, across the different uh, the different time periods. But though, of course, the the absolute units definitely did because the carbon budget is much bigger if you start from 1850 or it's much smaller if you start from 1992. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. I hope you, you survived this geeking moment. I, I had to ask. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> I don't know how geeky. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm incredibly geeky. And so... <laughs> I hope your listeners are at least at least a quarter as geeky as I am. And then we'll see. <laughs> Please let us know uh, your level of geekiness from one to Andrew to to know. <laughs> um, okay, great. Perhaps we can go with the the last paper I want to to um, talk about, which is the compensation for atmospheric appropriation that was very recently published. I think a couple of months ago. Um, I think this is kind of the culmination of the different points that you just mentioned, you know, overshooting, the, the fair share, uh, the donut economics and all of that, arriving to this world and regional cumulative emissions. And you also put forward about, I think it was more or less at the same amount, uh, sorry, the same time period where we learned how much was the record profits of fossil fuel companies And in your paper, you estimated what was the financial, well, the, the monetary amount for this compensation. C can you uh, elaborate a, a bit on this? Yeah, sure. So we, in this paper, it occurred to us that this, I mean, again, it's just, it started from two core principles. One is that we all share the atmosphere, that it's a shared collective wealth that no, you know, should be shared equitably and sustainably. And so if we start with that basis and we divide up, you know, what would be a reasonable share across across nations based on po population, then then we end up with this this picture of very, very over emitting nations. So if we know that the world as a whole basically needs to get to net zero by by 2050 or some time around then in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, then That's going to leave some countries who are massively overshooting their fair shares and some who are way below. Uh, so we ran a scenario that effectively just said, if all nations reach net zero by 2050, then this is what the level of, you know, below their fair share versus in excess of their fair share. And we could calculate the distance for each country. You know, are they just a little bit below? Are they just a little bit over? Or, you know, are... Have they only used like, next to nothing or are they way beyond it and so on? And what we ended up doing was saying, okay, let's take that distance, those excess emissions uh, of the over emitters and say, okay, these all together are the total excess emissions, which if we look to IPCC scenarios, we can actually see that there are carbon prices for those scenarios that respect 1.5 degrees. And we could say, okay, let's take the the median and interquartile range of, of carbon prices that are consistent over this series. And we can just, you know, value in, in monetary terms, excess emissions by saying, okay, if the world does follow this 1.5 degree pathway, this is what IPCC scenarios suggest carbon prices would look like. And so we did that and we ended up with a figure around 192 trillion dollars between 2020 and 2050, uh, which works out to around, you know, almost seven trillion dollars per per year. And the next stage of the analysis then says, okay, this is the value of the excess emissions. And what we did was just allocate those to undershooting in nations based on the proportion of you know, undershoot, whether what I said before, like, are they just a little bit under? Like, what is the actual value of emissions between their fair share and how much they're under? And allocate funds based on that, on that amount that they're essentially giving up. And, and so when we did that, it ends up being, you know, some 57 trillion goes to India. Uh, it's, it's some very, very large 
large quantities. But again, I would argue it seems like a potential way to to acknowledge the responsibility for for bringing getting getting into this climate mess uh, in a way that will at the same time I guess what I should note this is just these funding amounts are just to to acknowledge the loss of fair shares this doesn't even get into the additional costs of what it would mean to reach net zero or to adapt to a 1.5 degree warmer world so we position them as you know that these are these are additional compensation values yeah the net minimum and what was funny the, so you mentioned seven trillions per year for the the compensation and right 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 around this time there was i think a guardian or whatever article that said that this was the profits of fossil fuel companies for that year and it was more or less equal for the well, same year and oh uh, yeah you're and, right and we're, You're, I don't know if you remember that, but it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think yeah. I did, and I think I, I just tend to block out those statistics in my brain. So I'm just now too unfair. But oh, that's terrible. Yeah. But but also how feasible this is, right? I, I think we exactly. always need to to make it more. Op I don't know if it's optimistic, but realistic that you know these type of amounts that seem to be ungodly, they're made by profits by a bunch of companies. So. The money does exist and this could happen, right? Exactly. No, you're right. That's a great point. That's a great point to bring. <laughs> and we, we also looked at, I mean, these these values in terms of percentages of GDP. So if you translate mm. those into an annual percent of GDP, of course, in, in the high emitting, you know, bloated economies of the global north, the percentage of, of compensation is, I mean, it's not small. I think in the US, or it's around 10%. Of, of, of annual GDP would be in compensation values. But if you look to Sub-Saharan Africa or India, we looked at Sub-Saharan Africa, I think it was more than 100% of GDP is what they would be entitled to receive in this, in this scenario. And similarly in India, it was something like 70% of annual GDP. So these are transformation, you know, transformative uh, like receipts. It's just so, so such a difference compared to the actual everyday negotiations at the UNFCCC where of course lots of these this adaptation fund was uh, promised when was it in 2015 i think the 100 billion dollars for adaptation funding to to the lowest income countries and by 2020 you know the rich nations didn't meet that goal and to the extent that That they have provided funding, it's often debt related. So these nations are going into debt, in well, at the same time, it's getting counted as climate finance. It's just so I think that there's, yeah, very much a need to to rebalance this whole conversation. That these aren't this isn't charity. These aren't handouts. There's a there's a liability here that that needs to be accounted for. Um, I'd like perhaps to finish uh, before I ask you some. Uh you know, rather general questions with the concept of provisional, uh, provision of systems, well, provisional systems and provisioning systems. And what is a bit the, the, the centerpiece between the two limits, right? I mean, the, the planetary one and the, the social one, of course, the, the empirical studies that you carry out enable us to understand what the, the shape of things are, where are the dynamics, what would be fair, but ideally we need to transform, completely shift what is happening today. And that would be instead of saying, okay, um, how much our provisioning systems are consuming today, let's flip it on its head, what are the essential needs and what can we provide to these needs uh, in order to, to stay within planetary boundaries? What, what, How do you see these provisioning systems and uh, how do you mobilize it? Or what are some some of your thoughts about this? Yeah, that's so I think that this is foundational. And again, Julia Steinberger is is really uh, had a huge influence on me with with this whole. But we proposed it as uh, I mean, J Julia in particular, together with Dan O'Neill and Will Lamb proposed it as this like conceptual intermediary to try to help explain the variability we see empirically. And so it's like, listen, 
we don't know what this is, but clearly there's something going on that allows Costa Rica to, to, you know, have the same social outcomes with a fraction of the level of resource use as the United States or, and so on. So how can we understand what that could be? And we proposed it in that first national donut paper as just a, a black box essentially. And we, I tried to do some thinking about it in a, in a subsequent paper called provisioning systems for a good life within planetary boundaries that brought me into, you know, it was one of those papers that you just end up reading so much. And it was like this very deep, critical social science, uh, like anyway, it, it, I learned a lot, but at the same time, there's a lot of ontology and epistemology and these, these like, you know, hefty what is it need? What is and, essential? Yeah. 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 Well, that's that I can get behind. It's just the sometimes when, when particularly scholarly work can get very dense and very, very like <laughs> feeling as if you yeah, really need to, we need to dive deep into these. Um, but we ended up identifying several theories as we got theories broadly understood that are present in the literature that are looking at, you know, sustainable resource use and achieving human needs, whether it's multi-level perspective or the you know, social ecological systems or uh, social provisioning perspectives from heterodox economics, like a handful of them. And we found that, you know, not none of them are really filling this black box perfectly, but we tried, again, building on donut economics because Kate has also done some thinking around around the types of economic actors that we you know, we should acknowledge and that might take us further towards the donut, which is just recognizing that, of course, we have this markets, but there's also the state, there's also our households, there's also commons. And we identified a couple other elements of a provisioning system in trying to pull together a theory of, you know, the material stocks that a place already has and the techniques that are at hand. And, and we argued that each the satisfaction of basic needs, each whatever that need is, whether it's food or education or water or what have you, is going to be satisfied through the these systems of interlocking elements and of course the way that that those those elements, households, markets, so on, so on, are connected to one another. Their relationships and the power dynamics between them are also going to have a big impact on the levels of resource use and and how well they achieve social outcomes. And we really pulled out this thread on if we're going to have this idea of provisioning systems, then I thought it was really, really important to bring in almost its 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 alter ego, its evil, its evil twin, which would be uh, appropriating systems, right? And so we argued that within a given provisioning system, which if the goal of a provisioning system is to satisfy a foreseen, you know, a, a human need, then an appropriating system is kind of a part of that that is getting sucked away in order to satisfy, you know, the goal of, of we argue, rent extraction, rent extraction writ large. So that, of course, every society is going to have some level of rent extraction uh, by an elite or so on. But that dynamic between the satisfaction of human needs and and extraction is something that something that we should take into account across each of the each of those need satisfiers. So that was, that's as far as my thinking has gone right now. What I want to do next is to try to to see what we can do about attaching, you know, empirical work around that. And Yefim Vogel uh, had a paper out that was looking at provisioning factors. You know, what is it? What are factors that allow some nations to do better or worse than others? And I think that type of research is 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 really really valuable and needed. So I think. It's very interesting the, the the way that you have, well, how you navigate between you know your past knowledge, uh, international studies, quantitative stuff, and then going back to more social studies, embedding them into that. I can even imagine like a model that could somehow having your empirical stuff and the theory of of provisioning system and appro appropriating systems and kind of model things to to foresee how things are going in the future. Of course, I, I might putting my own dreams in, in your uh, <laughs> in your head, but um, I'm wondering, um, you know, you have one foot in practice, one foot in academia. Uh, 
uh, on the one hand, you see w what needs to be done in practice. On the other, you understand how we also need to change our mental models, our research models, uh, our worldviews. So I can imagine this is very prolific and very interesting to, to you know, navigate or jump between one and the other. How, how do you, yeah, how do you experience that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's I'm in I'm in a position that I I feel incredibly privileged because I am, as you say, straddling this this type of academic world where the conversation we're having right now is actually much. The fact that we have the vocabulary, a shared vocabulary that I can speak to you and feel like you're, you know, had the privilege to dedicate time and understanding and reading to to speak this same language that many people because of different life choices or because of, of whatever, they don't speak that language. And so a lot of the time I'm speaking with working together with city practitioners or with, you know, community uh, people who are reaching out interested in the concepts of donut economics and our work, which is really about making visible those who are putting the putting into practice the ideas of donut economics in many, many different ways. And one of my hats, I guess I have three hats. One of them is to be, to an extent, leading research-led work, which is kind of what we've been talking about so far today. Another part of my research or of my of my work is is about trying to start building a network or a community of researchers who are engaging with the concepts of donut economics. So one of the ways that we try to do so is by providing tools that we make available in in the comments, so that anyone who wants to pick things up. Uh, can go to our website and they can they can do so. And I've really really enjoyed a couple tools. Uh, one is a list of academic articles and reports. It's as nerdy as it gets, but uh, <laughs> a list, <laughs> just compiling a list of academic articles and reports that are engaging with the core concepts of donut economics. Like it doesn't have to be we're doing the donut, but just super important seminal things that are coming up. And I just update this list every six months or so. But the uh, the process of doing so, I just, uh, it's just, it's great. I just get to read it and then I put it out there and maybe I tweet about it. And then people are like, well, this is great. Look at all these things. <laughs> I'm like, I know. Um, the, so that's one. And it's it's incredibly nerdy. It's But I think there's a, like 120 or 130 articles on there now where I need to now think about restructuring because it's almost too much. But, yeah, like tags you know, and how do I filter them yeah, myself? Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> it's just by year and it's, you know, it's going back. Anyway, but another very similar one that's almost even more exciting is around a list of academic articles, uh, no, list of academic dissertations, particularly master's and bachelor's dissertations because donut Oof, economics yeah. is, it's so practice-led and it's so like, it's it's quite new that a lot of the time some of the, the, the vanguard, the forefront of research is is being done by master students, and they you know sit down and they work on a case study or do some interviews or do some quantitative analysis or whatever it is, write up a thesis. Uh, but those you know those unless they get published in the literature, which not a lot of master's dissertations do that because people get job offers, they move on, they do whatever. Um, they're very, very dispersed. So I've been putting calls out all the time just to be like, okay, hey, when you, if you do a dissertation, just send it to me. And I add it to this list. And I think it's just, I've heard from students already, like pr prospective students later can have this resource of like, what have other master students been doing? And they can dive into it. And plus I get to read uh, some, some very, very interesting work on that. So those are, those are, that's another part of, trying to build a network or a community of, of donut economics practitioners, researchers, uh, researcher activists, I guess, if you, if you want to call it that. And then the third part is, is about like supporting from a technical or data-led perspective, particularly cities or communities or those who are aiming to apply these concepts, working with data in their places. And that's just because oftentimes it's, you know, it's not, the skills they haven't spent six years, ten years, diving into these concepts, and it it can be a lot. And so I've been I've been really, yeah, it's a something that I really really enjoy is trying to distill these concepts, which I have not done well in this conversation. I don't think I've, I've geeked out far too much. 
Wait, I didn't ask you to, so yeah, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but that's another really, really interesting and, and to me very impactful work because you can start bringing in ecological economics concepts and metrics and things or donut economics and but doing so in just a completely different context instead of academics it comes out as a you know as a strategic policy or as a circular economy policy or something or maybe it never gets seen at all but it's a series of workshops that happen within departments themselves or you know the different different ways that you can engage is to me it's fascinating and and hopefully leads to leads to change in action yeah indeed hopefully uh it would require another episode to dive into cities and to understand how you downscale that to cities and how do you uh, have these difficult conversations let's park it there let's say that uh, we're going to have another discussion uh, on this in the future because it really is also you know how do you land this into territories and to communities how do you make this operational These are fundamental questions, which I think we also perhaps lack some uh, distance, uh, you know, from the theory to the actual practice. We there is so much to learn and so much to to understand that uh, at least I need some distance to understand all of this. I, I clearly don't have all of the pieces of the puzzle. So let's say that uh, we reconvene and, and talk about all of this. Um, so just to sum up and to I generally ask if you have any particular movie or film or song or anything that you would like to share that might help us, you know, continue in the same vein of our discussion. Did you see anything or did you learn anything recently that you'd like to share? Um, I recently went back to, and I mean, this is, this is, it's completely true, but it's almost cliche, but I recently went back to Thinking in Systems by Danila Meadows. I was recently looking at the Leverage Points article, just, and I found that one of the, again, one of those moments where, I mean, she wrote it after the 1970s, but of course she and Dennis Meadows and Herman Daly and so many of these thinkers have been, have, thinkers and doers have been, have diagnosed the problems so long ago. So I guess I take, I take inspiration from from those who came before, particularly in the 70s and so on. And I guess there's that, what is it, that famous quote that, yeah, everything has already been said before, but since nobody was listening, you have to say it again or so, something along those lines. And so that's just a general one that we shouldn't feel bad as long as we are, as long as we are acknowledging our, our intellectual ancestors then I think these, these things need saying again and again and finding interesting ways to do so and show them and tell stories through pictures and, and words is something that gets me gets me very so I guess Donella Meadows I always always go back to always go back to her. Well I think it's a it's a great well you never can go wrong with uh, Donella Meadows so <laughs> let's let's leave it at here. Thanks so much Andrew for The conversation it led me to your papers it led me to to understand a bit more what you're doing it helped me a lot and also i wanted to thank everyone you know watching listening trying to understand this somewhat complex elements but i think will lead us towards more just uh, transformations uh, we mentioned during our conversation uh, herman daly on steady state economics go watch or listen to that episode there's one episode with uh, Julia Steinberger, Jason Hickel, and Yorgos Kallis on their new projects. We, we had a conversation with Kate Raworth on donut economics in cities. So thanks again for the conversation. Thank you. This is great. This is great. 